Hello, Moto America fans. Welcome to this latest edition of Off Track with Carruthers and Bice. I'm Sean Bice, and I'm joined by, as always, our communications manager, Paul Carruthers. Uh, we are one week away from going to the Coda round, which is our, well, they say the penultimate round, although <laughs> there was a time where a lot of people thought that meant the last. But it's oh, the I always one. used to fix Everybody wrote this, that in the story. I always had to fix it. I'm like, it's not it's not the last one. <laughs> right, right. It's not the greatest ultimate. It's the before the ultimate. So It should but, just um, be scrapped from the English language, I think. I agree many, with you. Yeah, it's too confusing. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to say second to the last round in the season. And we are joined by the current Super Sport Championship leader by 25 points. Points, or if you're keeping score at home, a full race win uh, of, of a lead. Matthew Skoltz with Strack Racing Yamaha, who is leading PJ Jacobson right now in a in an absolute battle this year. And it's been fun. And man, there's a lot of stuff to talk about in it. But Matthew. Um, wait, wait, wait. I, I have a confession first. Okay. Okay. When he signed up on this deal, I'm like, this is either going to go horribly wrong or really, really good. And Matthew, I'm sorry I didn't have more confidence, but it's oh, gone. I it, say, trust me. <laughs> it's gone really, really, really good. Like when I was looking at the championship point standings today, I mean, it's crazy how good you have a season you've had. Go ahead, Sean. I'm sorry. I just wanted to no, let know. Well, I, I no, was a dickhead. <laughs> no, it's okay because Matthew, that's one of the things I want to talk about. Even during the Atlanta round, I was kind of wondering what was going on. I'm sure you were too. That that first round for Super Sport for you, it was a little dicey for a while. We still weren't sure what was going to happen. You guys were kind of adapting to that team a little bit. Let's go back to that point and talk contrast that with where you are now and how you've progressed this season. Um, you 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 know there were some unknowns to start with, right? Yeah, I mean, firstly, having spent so much of my of the last couple of years racing on a super bike, I didn't know how I was going to fare getting back down on the little super sport bike. But we had a, a few few days of preseason testing, and I started getting a lot more comfortable on the bike. And you know, I kind of went into the first round of the season not not kind of you know thinking that I would be battling up front yet. Um, and obviously, we had we had problems with uh, with you know the bike, and I missed a lot of track time practicing and everything else. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I qualified around about 15th place, which obviously we weren't happy with, but I think I, I got only maybe 20 or, or so minutes on the actual track. So it wasn't too bad, but you know, I think finishing, I think it was third in the first race on Saturday. Um, I kind of knew from that point on, you know, having that, having that much speed coming through the field and managing to catch up to the top guys that it wasn't going to be the weekend that we hoped for getting 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 you know wins but I, I kind of could see that we had the pace and we would be battling for the for the championship there um yeah. so but yeah it's it's been a really positive climb throughout the season and i think that that we've more than made up for, for that first round you know um um a uh, mishap <laughs> does it feel like when you ride that r6 compared to riding the r1 for so long does it kind of feel like a little toy and you kind of you kind of own it, right? Like, I mean, you can just feel like you do anything on it. Whereas a super bike, you're kind of like it. It has a tendency to ride you a little. Yeah, I mean, you kind of you definitely have to ride the bike, you know, differently to how you ride the super bike. And it took me a while to kind of get that confidence of opening the throttle up to a hundred percent on the side of the tire. You know, I guess on the super bike, you don't really do that. So, I think the hardest part was, you know, always diving into corners on the. R6, you know, it's pretty easy to get the thing turned, you know, um, and stop when you when you want to. Whereas the R1, kind of, you have a lot more, you know, like weight pushing you forward. Um, but yeah, I just suffered coming out of the corners a little bit, just getting used to not not having that much that much torque. But yeah, I mean, uh, overall, I kind of managed to work things out quickly. You know, fortunately for us, the first round was at Road uh, at Road Atlanta, which is a track that I've always done, you know, you know, well at and it 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 just gave me the confidence for the rest of the season from there. Yeah. So Matthew, I mean you're on the motorcycle that is the smallest displacement engine. And obviously the R6 is legendary with what it's done in Super Sport. Um you you know you you're racing with your who you are, your shape, your size. You're racing against obviously PJ's smaller in stature on a 955 cc bike, and I get the fact that it's absolutely electronically controlled. I know they don't get the full throttle. I don't know how it's all balanced out, but I just know that it is. And I know it still has some advantages that yours doesn't. 
but does it seem surprising to you that here you are on this little bike and you're making it making it work i mean if you're good with it well um i would i would say that the r6 surprisingly has some has some serious top end speed on it you know the i would say the top ends me maybe the first two rounds of the season when we were a little were, were being a little bit con conservative on the motor you know because we didn't really know how the package would do or what we or what kind of power we were actually needing from it but you know once we got the full package that we've been running the last couple of races you know the top end speed i mean i've probably got one of the quickest parks you know as far as top end goes once i kind of click into about fourth or, or fifth i don't really lose too much time there it's more just the punch out of the corners that uh, that, that i think the higher displacement bikes have more torque you know so you play just kind of punch out of the corners a, a little bit quicker but you know overall i think when i'm when i'm able to run on my lines and just flow and get onto the side of the tire and just you know roll through the corner a little bit more i don't, I don't notice it too much but it does make it difficult battling with, with those guys you know when they kind of park it slightly slightly more because obviously with having that much torque they have to pick up the bike onto the fatter part of the tire you know so i think battling through tighter twistier tracks has been harder when i've been trying to pass them on or, or get through the pack but i think once once I'm kind of able to put the back on the side and roll through, through the corners and um you know I think I think the back handles better than than anything else there in the super sport class and I just gotta make up for that lack of uh, um lack of punch out of the corners yeah and I mean the other part of that too Matthew I mean you having ridden so many years in super biking on and that r1 and with a, a full electronic suite I mean you guys were always adjusting something engine braking tc anything you know, lift control all the stuff that you can do on a super bike tell us about super sport next generation the fact that you can't do a lot of that stuff and is it kind of i don't know is it refreshing or a little nice that you don't get lost in the in the uh the formula so to speak there's only so many things you can do yeah i just think that it you know that it you know, narrows the setup down, you know, because whereas on the super bike, we, we could change how much traction control we were getting from corner one to two, three, whatever, you know, and you could change torque maps for different corners, different sections of the racetrack, whereas the R6 now, but whatever you've got, you can obviously change how much, you know, the bike is, you know, pulling back on you into the corners and, you know, first, second, third, fourth, but you can't change it specifically for, for each corner on the track. Um, and I'd say that they both have their pros and cons because there's been a few times this year that, you know, breaking into a second gear corner, I would have, you know, wanted way more, you know, you know, the EB in a second gear corner, corner two here, but then going into corner four, I would way too much, you know, so you kind of have to go in the middle and just find that 50, 50 and just make it work for you. Whereas the super bike, you were tailoring the bike for every single corner, you know, so yeah, it definitely has its pros and cons as it definitely makes things simpler for me riding, you know, not, not, not to give so much feedback and to kind of, you know, remember how much changes we made, which corner, trying to worry about giving us feedback on traction control, engine brake, setup, and everything else. The okay. debriefs are, are definitely shorter now. <laughs> okay, so Sean and I love a good rivalry, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And, I, and we think we have one here. Oh, you know, yeah. and, I, we, and we don't even have to stir the pot too much. You know, it's just kind of there. You can tell it's always simmering a little bit. Like in the press conferences, you know, there's times when I look at your face and you're ready to come unglued and I see PJ's face <laughs> and he's ready to come unglued. So far, nobody's totally come unglued. But the racing's yeah. been terrific, right? I mean, and and you you must enjoy the battle because if you didn't have PJ or he didn't have you, you'd be pretty bored. Yeah, I mean, I would I would think that the wins would definitely come a lot, you know, you know, easier if PJ wasn't there. But I also think that it, you know, validates the class more, you know, than if PJ was just winning every single race or if I was winning every single race. But I, I know Tyler's won, I think, two or three races this season, so he's also proven that he can do it. But yeah, I mean, I think PJ and myself are pushing each other to go faster, we're getting better lap times, work on the setup more. And we always, every single practice sessions, I'm looking at the lap times to see what, what he's doing. Let's put it that way. Matthew, how much, how, how many pounds lighter are you this year than you were last year? 
Uh, I mean, last year I was sitting in probably the high 60s, 70. Um, I'm probably about 159, 160 now. So I've lost about another seven, uh, eight pounds roughly about there. Um, you know, you obviously don't need as much, you know, muscle or, or strength riding the super sport bike. But I think I've just really focused on, on my cardio, knowing that I've got a 600 against these 950s and well, whatever else. It's kind of given me a little bit more of a push to do more cardio work. Um, but yeah, I mean, fortunately for me, being a, a taller, bigger guy, the bike has really proven to be that that is quick, you know, as far as the top end speed goes. Is it hard for you to lose that kind of weight? I mean, I I mean, I don't know how you do it. You you seem to be able to kind of adjust yourself to whatever you need to physically. And you say, of course, mu you know, muscles heavier than is heavy when you have muscles. So you've had to be less muscular, I guess, this year and and focus on other areas but you can only do so much so is it is it if you were if you were doing a role for a movie and you had to lose whatever is it is that easy for you to do i mean i guess so and i've got a really small small skinny frame and both of my parents are you know rakes so i think it runs into the family that we just just naturally skinny people <laughs> but, do, you get to, do you get do you get to drink beer at all anymore or not I drink a couple, you know, only on Ultras. weekends. <laughs> yeah, low carb stuff, right? <laughs> you know, you know, it is true about your family, though. I mean, gosh, when I see your dad, he puts me right to shame. I'm like, my God, the guy's still, you know, what do you call this him? The, the, the silverback? Silverback, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you guys the are all in shape. Back. <laughs> you guys are all in shape though your dad obviously your brother dean and, and your mom i mean everybody stays in good shape and that's cool that's that's good that you have that in your family um but okay but it's but you're a super bike rider and you had been for a long time um it's no it's no uh no surprise to anybody that you decided to do this because there weren't really any options in superbike. and i i told you this the other day you've really shot up the chart with race wins. You know, you had, you had a handful in Superbike, which is awesome, but you now yeah. have a lot more race wins with what you've been able to do in super sports. So that kind of is nice for building your resume a little bit, but, but you still want, you want to, you want to get back to Superbike at some point. Yeah. I mean, I would say collecting wins in the super sport class is obviously nice. And, uh, you know, the contingency bonuses have been great. But I think, um, you know, it just doesn't quite compare to a Superbike win. No, but I think in the Superbike class, maybe I would win one every year or so, and it was magical. You know? But whereas the Super Sport class, we're going to every single race knowing that we should be riding at the top, you know, um, and winning. I thought of something this morning that makes a lot of sense. Like, I see the Strack racing guys, and I walk by there, and they've got the nice setup, and they seem to really, like, I've had conversations with them. They seemed like they really are enjoying what's going on right now. Obviously winning, being on the podium all the time makes it fun for a team. But but it seems to me that they could actually look towards making that step of perhaps doing a superbike team. I mean, there's no way, there's no reason why they couldn't become the next Westby team, for example. No, I mean, definitely not. I think that every single person at Strike Racing has proven that they're capable of running a professional team, capable of, you know, winning races. You know, the owner, uh, Peter and his wife, Jess, are just, you know, fantastic people. My crew chief, Ed, followed me from the Westby team. He's been great. He knows what I like as far as set up. You know, Jordan Strange um, and Josh working on the bike. They make sure everything's perfect for me. We haven't had problems with, you know, anything as you know loose parts of this or that you know i know hopping on the bike every time that that's gonna be uh, perfect for me you know i'll be in sean working looking at the data stuff tires and e e everything else i think everyone knows what they have to do and if they do what, what they're supposed to and it's been working out perfect you know i just got to keep it together for the last two races okay so my idea is a good one and we'll get him to do that <laughs> I would love to, you know, um, uh, I, I definitely have kind of mentioned it to Peter that I want to move up to Superbike and would love for, for him to be the, the, the guy that kind of helps me there. Um, but I think at this point, the main thing is for us just to focus on the last two races of the season. But I mean, Paul, if you want to drop one or two, uh, you know, you know comments there, yeah, it would, right. be, would be good. I'll, I'll turn it up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, poke him a little bit, it's fine. 
I mean, heck, it is it is the progression that Westby had with, you know, the Daytona Sport Bike with Dane and then moving up. You were Super Stock 1000 and, you know, then into Superbike full on. So it, it is a progression that a team you've been on before has done. I want to ask you about Ed Sullivan. He's you've worked with him a long time. Um, yeah. Is he is he a different guy this year? Or is he the same guy? Yeah, um, it is exactly the same. And I think that there's a, a lot less. um parts and problems that could go wrong on the super sport bike. So he definitely has more time to kind of chill out in the pit, but Captain Sullivan is the most cool level, level headed person in the pit. You know, he always cheers me in the right direction. He knows what he wants from me. He's not afraid to kind of tell me when I've done something right, when I've screwed up. And I, th I think the best thing that I really love about Ed is that he genuinely cares about, you know, me as as his rider, you know, I guess we've worked together for so long and hopefully we can carry on and bring the championship home. Yeah. I mean, that's going to be it, to, to, to be able to do that, you know, for really this, this first year with you on that team and with Peter, I mean, I know he's very enthusiastic about Moto American being involved in it. So it, it's, you, you guys have had a, had a huge amount of success. Um, what, what do you need to do? Okay. You're, you're, uh, you're a race went ahead. There are four races left. Um, I'm sure you're going to want to win all of them. You're not going to be doing any uh, preservation of points, right? I mean, you're just going to do what you need to do. Uh, yeah, I mean, by this, by this stage of the season, I think I kind of just have to focus on the championship. But, you know, I think it's that when you, you start worrying about it too much and start, you know, when you're actually out there on the track focusing on, okay, I'm in third spot now if I lose nine points here and you, you kind of take your your mind off of actually racing as fast as you, you can that that's when you, you start maybe crashing or running wild and, and making those kind of silly mistakes so I'm just going to carry on doing what I've been doing and you know hopefully it, it works out it's been pretty good so far you know I think last race I um, think with maybe four laps to go I kind of thought I was going to bring a, a third home and then just kind of got into a groove dropping by lap times by over half a second and and to kind of catch up to Tyler and PJ and pass them both, you know. So I think it's just always just focusing on just racing and doing what I'm doing right there in front of me. Those races like we had um, at Mid-Ohio where it's rain, dry, I mean, just a mess, right? And you're trying to decide what tires to use. That's got to be incredibly stressful. Yeah, <laughs> very, very stressful, you know, because it's one of those races that if I chose wets and PJ chose, you know, slicks and, he finished first, first, and I was fifteenth. You know, I would have swung the whole, the whole championship then. So I think um, we just kind of waited to see what, to what, to what the Ray Hall guys and PJ were doing first, and then they went slicks. They were like, you know what, screw it, we're going slicks too. Yeah, and was the and thing. we both finished twentieth and twenty-first, fine. You know, but we'll be on the same tires under the same conditions. Smart. Yeah, yeah, and then ironically, <laughs> Ma uh, ironically, Matthew. Um, I mean, I don't know. When it comes to this stuff, I never know quite how to ask it, but you got you and you and PJ both crashed in the same corner for obvious reasons. There was oil on the track. Did you yeah. did you have any idea? I mean, I don't I don't I always I used to ask Josh Hayes this. Did you expect to crash? And he always laughs at me. He says, no, I didn't expect to crash. But did I that, never expect to crash. <laughs> right. That's exactly right. But you guys both went down. I mean, was it just something where you, you knew there was something happening in there? I mean, did you feel losing the bike pretty pretty I mean, early I, on no i mean when uh, when i tucked the front i kind of knew that something was wrong because it wasn't a very strange spot i didn't feel the front end push i didn't feel the chatter and it was just suddenly one second it was there and just completely be closed you know and so I, I didn't know that something had been dropped onto the track and i was busy sliding on my back you know just kind of thinking man i've just screwed this whole championship up and then and kind of slid into the gravel trap and pj just came flying past me bouncing You're like yes crash too and i was like well you know maybe it's not too bad <laughs> both of us crash uh, you know, so it was one of those things that, that i was pretty pretty pissed at first but then when i saw saw pj crash like okay you know it's not too bad over there no because uh because i think that, that if we both scored you know zero points it would it would favor me more you know, yeah. but then obviously one of the marshals came over to me sprinting that if we saw that there was oil down or something and then then the red flag came out and figured that there had been oil dropped in that corner and obviously the red flag came out 
not just because of the crash, but because of the oil and the cleanup. So there was some extra yeah. time there that that was obviously very helpful to both teams. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, um, I kind of managed to get the bike going a bump it and just kind of limped it back into the pit. PJ was on the back of the car. So yeah, I think that the rain poured down a couple more, a couple minutes after that and just luckily gave us a few more you know, minutes to get the bike back together. Yeah. No, you know, I, I butchered the question, but you absolutely nailed it, Matthew. Thank you for understanding that. That's what I wanted to understand is your mindset of feeling what that was like and then seeing PJ and all that. So thank you for giving that to us. And the, the other part of that. I, I, just to just say, I don't like to, to see other people crashing, but <laughs> but when you crash and your main championship rival crashes in the same corner, you're like, Phew. Yeah, thank you. Maybe it wasn't as bad as I thought. Yeah, it's a good day now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it, it brings up something, Matthew. I've never asked your rider this. I don't know if this is another crazy one, but so you you were at, in the lead, and what what happened was the person who was towards the back of the pack. So the next time you came around in that corner, that corner was different than it was. That when that happens, do you go into a corner expecting it to be a certain way because it felt that way the lap before? Or do you always leave a little in reserve of, well, maybe this isn't going to feel the same as it was? Do you know what I mean by that? You know, kind of. I mean, I, I just, you know, do you think that the track's going to be the same every single lap, you know? And if you break up the five board and you, you made it the previous lap, why won't you make it this lap? You know, you're kind of tipping at the same point every lap. and. And I feel that that's when I'm flowing the best is when I just find it the same brake marker, tip and point, and everything just rides exactly the same. You know, you're not, you know, you're not anticipating that there's going to be sand down or there'll be oil or whatever else, you know. But whenever you see the yellow and the red flag, which is oil down or change of surface, then I do maybe kind of move two, three feet off of the racing line just for that lap to make sure that there was no oil down or something. But, you know, unfortunately, there weren't flags there. So I just tipped in as if it was a regular lap and ended up pushing the front. Right. Okay. Um, and along those lines, this is another a little bit of road racing 101 that I just want popped in my head. I got to ask you about. Do you always know what, what turn, what the n number of the turn is? And do you always know what gear you're in? Uh, for the most part now, I mean, I've been racing the series for what, eight years. I don't even have to look at the track map anymore. You know, I kind of know this one's corner four or five. Um, but yeah, when there's a brand new track, it does take you a couple of laps or sessions to know that this is corner eight, nine, ten. But um, I'm, I'm a very big advocate of using the track map and actually pointing to the corner so that, you know, so that the team knows I'm specifically talking about this corner and right down entry, exit mid corner you know just so so there is no confusion but you know as far as riding um on the track and knowing gears like you you do know every single gear that you win i mean sometimes i might not know that i'm in second or third gear but i know okay breaking into this corner i'm going two gears down i'm going up up one between here and there and then you kind of have to count okay if i wasn't first we're going to third number <laughs> you know what i mean so you, you can always work it out <laughs> right yeah well, th th that's that's a great description. That's exactly what I wondered. Okay, and Mid Ohio. I mean, let's talk about that somewhat. It's the, it's an interesting track in a lot of ways. The layout's amazing. The facility is amazing. But there's some things about that surface that are a little strange. And um, I, I've talked to riders about it. It's a little funny in the morning. It comes in a little different in the afternoon. Obviously, you had to deal with rain on top of all that. What do you think of the layout of the track? You know, the S's, the carousel, all that stuff. And then do you, do you, did you experience that thing with whatever the grip situation is? I mean, the, the layout's, um, you know, perfect. So one of my favorite tracks now, you know, I found that the R6 worked really, really well there. Um, you know, so I always have fun at tracks that, that I managed to go quicker at and I get a good, you know, result on. Um, but yeah, I mean, the track surface, usually from the Friday to the Sunday, you can, you know, notice quite a big improvement in the grip level overall. But for some reason, that track just never really got better. I mean, on the, the Thursday in the Dunlop test, we were chewing up tires and four or five laps and that and that did get better by the Sunday. But overall, I just think that all of the rain that we got on Friday and Saturday now just kind of washed all of the rubber that was getting put down. 
and kind of just, you know, made the truck green every single day. Yeah, that's hard to deal with. All right, so let's move forward to Coda. I think you like that track. I You've won on that track before on a superbike, so you you know what Got you're mixed doing. Mixed emotions there. there. Okay, <laughs> well, Mixed yeah. emotions on that track. I've done extremely well, and I've had some terrible, terrible races there. You know, and I kind of just think it's one of those tracks that sometimes you go there and you ride on your absolute limit and you the fastest guy. Next time out, you'll be on your, your limit and you'll be one and a half seconds off and you, you, you don't know what's wrong. I think it's just got so many corners that you're going back on yourself and, you know, a lot of flip-flops and super tight corners that you can get lost, you know, and kind of overcharge corners. So it's, it's, it's a very tricky track, I would say. Will it be good for your bike there? I don't know. I'll figure it out then. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that maybe the first <laughs> two sections of the track, you know, when there's a lot of tight, twisty corners, you're on the side for a lot of what will be good for the R6. But, you know, there's obviously a couple of first gear tight, you know, hairpin corners, which I'm going to suffer a lot on. But like I was saying, I think there's so many corners that I can kind of, you know, make up for that deficit on the punch coming out. Yeah, I mean, you had a really apt description about how some of those turns, they do come back on themselves a little bit. Turn one, is that, it just seems weird to me. You're going fast, you go uphill, which causes you to slow down a little bit, but that turn is so tight. I mean, I don't understand that yeah. turn. Is that hard for you? Yeah, I mean, it's it's probably one of the only corners on the calendar that we have to use first gear, you know, so... Um, I definitely think that Coda was kind of made as a car track because there are a few super tight hairpin corners that aren't that aren't the most fun on a superbike, you know, previously riding there. But I'll see how the R6 goes. But I mean, yeah, it's just such a big, beautiful track. I don't see why they have to have one or two corners that you're almost turning back on yourself on and on a, a down. <laughs> is the is the corner out back? Is that a first gear or is that second gear? The one going onto the big think, back Uh the First corner, the corner onto the back straight, off the back straight, and that like hairpin left, left hander in the like, stadium section, I think it is. Yeah, I mean, those are super slow corners. Got to be some of the slowest corners on the calendar. That's crazy. So then New Jersey, uh, they've repaved it. And we've been hearing reports from a lot of people that have been there and, you know, it, it needed to be repaved. You're, I'm sure you're looking forward to going there. And, and I, I think... I remember in the Westby days, I mean, it, you, it seemed like the team, everybody liked to be there. Is that how you feel about New Jersey as well? Yeah, I mean, surprisingly, I always did pretty, pretty good at, at Jersey. It, it kind of reminds me of a South African track, you know, on the tracks that I grew up with back home, like these really tight, bumpy, narrow, twisty tracks. And I always, yeah, I've had really good results there. Um, obviously, it did need a little bit of a repay, but it was one of the bumpier, bump, bumpier tracks. But yeah, I mean, I think it's going to suit the R R6 well. But, you know, obviously, obviously, I'm hoping to not take the championship down to the final race on Sunday there. But, you know, I, I know that, that 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 is one of PJ's home tracks. And I know that he goes ex extremely well there. So um, I'm hoping to kind of hopefully not be racing on this Sunday to kind of take the, the championship at that point. You mentioned South Africa. What do you have plans to return there? Or is that a kind of thing where you just would, would like to stay here now for good? Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty much living here permanently now. I got my green card last year, you know, so that's been a, a, a real big help. Um, I, got, I got home for about two, three months every single year from December January, February kind of thing, just to see friends and family. But you know, I think that my life has moved here now. You know, America's home. I love it here. I've had a great time. I live in Georgia. And yeah, I mean, hopefully I'll be racing this championship for another couple of years. And, you know, I've, I've settled in well here. Love it. It'd be nice to get the whole family over, but that's might not be their plan. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I think that, that they said that back home, you know, both of my parents are in their late sixties and then really, I, I don't see them moving, but, but they will be here for the last two races over the season. So I'm, oh, I'm good. Really happy they're going to be coming in a couple, a couple of days. Perfect. Yeah. That's, that's really good. They're coming over. So yeah. Matthew, a lot of, a lot of the riders, I mean, would you, you, the reason you're in Georgia is because of Westby and because of Chuck Chiquetto and all that. I get that. But do you think you'd see yourself ever living in California or are you pretty happy about Georgia? You have a house there. You got your neighbors. They're like all your friends now. It's so cool. 
<laughs> how it is with you. Yeah, I mean, I just randomly moved to Georgia because that's where the Westby and Chuck's, you know, like home base was and where, where the bar crew was kept. And, you know, made some pretty cool friends here, you know, that are, that have been, you know, they're not a part of the racing scene. Um, the awesome guys. We got to play golf, mountain bike, got into the lake here. So I've just been, you know, loving it here. Georgia kind of, you know, reminds me of back home. And oh. California, that's, Ah, it's not, not not my favorite place to be honest you know but <laughs> the same I'll amount the same, the same same amount of, the same amount of animals as south africa just different kinds yeah, <laughs> the, yeah. The, the, the people kind but if you came <laughs> yeah. i guarantee i guarantee if you came here i'd fatten you up a little bit <laughs> yeah i mean but i, I, I was gonna have to spend about double as much money on fuel and everything else so, yeah, so, it's yeah little, I I mean, but you know georgia's georgia's home now you know the summer is beautiful winters are maybe a little bit cold but you know it reminds me of back home and my neighborhood here is great you know my neighbors a couple of years ago i've told this story many times when I broke my, um, my knee my when you know, the grass was getting a little bit long and i heard somebody mowing the grass and i was like hey Kira, that sounds like they're right outside there I look outside and my neighbor's mowing the lawn for me. And I so <laughs> the guys, the guys that have been great. We have a couple of beers in his garage sometimes. I mean, yeah, it's, it's been great living here. That's so cool. I want, I just figured with Cam Peterson, a close friend of yours being in California, you may gravitate towards there sometime, but I'm glad to hear that George is your home. It's good that you're for me, that you're in the same uh, time zone as me. Anyway, that I, I can relate yeah. to that pretty well. Paul, I have to figure out like what time is it there when I'm talking to him most of the time. <laughs> but, um, Luckily, I get up early. Yeah, he, yeah. <laughs> Paul gets up before I do most of the time. I mean, it's crazy. Um, so Matthew, Paul and I were talking about this before you came on, and it looks like Josh Heron's going to win this Superbike Championship. I mean, we've got three races. We're going to know a lot after the three races at. at Coda and then there are two more at New Jersey but I mean he's doing what he needs to do what, what's your prediction for Superbike this year I mean yeah I mean the the, the, the first of the uh, first half of the season was pretty pretty crazy I think there were a lot of guys crashing and missing races and it was rain and Bovier was getting hurt and but yeah I think the last couple you know rounds josh herons really showed that he's got it you know i think it was laguna race two mid ohio race two he had bobier sean to De dylan kelly a bunch of the guys on his ass but he held them off every time you know i think he's proven to be the strongest guy there you know at this point but you know code is a difficult track but i think that it also suits the suits the ducati you know petrucci went really really well there on that thing so you know he's obviously proven that the bike can go well. It's obviously, I think that they've paved one or two two corners, and I think Josh is really in form now. You know, but, but obviously, you know, I would just love to see really good racing up front. You know, whether yeah. it's Peterson, Gagne, you know, Bobier, Heron, whoever else. I just want to see a bunch of a bunch of guys up there racing. You know. And, Man, it, make, yeah. it makes me a little bit sad. Sad some sometimes we're watching them because I feel like I, I kind of should should be there racing. But with how things are going, I'm just happy to be out in the the championship and get to actually watch it with my friends ride too. Yeah, I um I sent a text actually just yesterday. I sent a text to Jake Gagne just to tell him, you know, sorry about what happened and felt bad and stuff. I didn't hear back from. Him. I didn't really expect to. But have you talked to him at all? No, I haven't, I haven't spoken to him since the, the last race. Um, okay. he, he's a bit of a recluse. He likes to do his own yeah. things. But, you know, I think that everyone knew that there was something wrong there. You know, you don't see Gagne finishing outside the top five or six and running, you know, more than a second off of the pace. You know, and it's very, very clear that something was actually hindering him. And I'm glad that he's taken time off to get fixed. So when he, he comes back, um, you know, he, he's, he is ready to win again. Because I think he rode probably two or three of the most dominant seasons that the series has ever seen. You know, he's a world class rider, and you know, we wish him all the best. Have yeah, you I mean, ever had hard... the arm pump issues? Yeah, loads and loads of times. I mean, I think every every single person that's ridden on a super bike has got arm pump somewhere, sometime. You know, but 
I, I always opted not to have the surgery because of complications. And it just seems that that's happened to quite a few people, you know, so I, I really have focused on, you know, working on my forearms on the super bike, not to get arm pump, you know, and, you know, the hydrating properly, training them right, riding half, half an hour motors on my, on my, you know, motocross bike camp. Yeah. But it's always something that you always got in the back of your mind that you have to be relaxed and not squeeze too much. Because once your arm pumps up, you're done. You know, you, you can't really hang on and you can't ride at that pace that you need to. Yeah, you know, Matthew, I mean, you're the very, you're the actual rider that I always talk about. When, the one guy that I'd seen suffer with arm pump, but has never had any of the surgery because it's something you just don't want to do, but you still manage it and, and still have to deal with it. It's, it's just yeah. heartbreaking to see that with Jake. I mean, it, you know, you hate to see it and you know, the feeling, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a safety thing, right? I mean, you can't feel what you're doing at that point. That's gotta be hard to deal with. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to go too much into Jake or what he right. was actually feeling. Cause I don't know if he's mentioned that out to the public, but yeah, I right. mean, once your arms pump up and you start losing, you know, the, that like speed over your hand and you, you can't grab the brakes as quick as you want to when you shut off, you know, it, it, it does get dangerous. And I, and I think it got to a point that Jake was more worried about his safety than actually riding as quick as he could. So he made it the right call there. Yeah. Your, your training, are you still doing quite a bit of moto in, with training? Yeah, yeah. I mean, motocross is probably one of the biggest, um, you know, assets to my training program. You know, I think if you can do half an hour on a 450 motocross bike, riding, you know, 25 minutes to half an hour on a super bike or super sport bike is easy work. You know, yeah. I would love to come out here and say that us road race guys are the most fit and the most, you know, muscly, handsome guys. But, you know, the motocross guys take it. You know, those guys' fitness is absolutely wild. Yeah. And, and, and you follow it, right? I mean, you, when, when it comes around, when it, Atlanta is supercross, you go to it. I mean, you, you follow off-road racing a fair amount, right? Yeah. I mean, I actually started racing motocross first when I was seven um, and then right. transitioned into road racing when I was about 13. Um, but yeah, I mean, motocross was my first love, you know, as far as motor bikes go. And I still follow the supercross motocross and actually go to the supercross race here. Um, uh, you know, I always watch them and just think like, man, those guys are, are crazy what they do. And whenever we, you know, speak to them, they always say that we nuts, you know, for doing, you know, 200 miles per hour. But I think what we do is a whole lot, you know, easier and safer than doing super cross. I agree. You, you've, you, you've got a birthday, you got a birthday coming up pretty soon. I'm not going to say what age you're going to be, but it's coming 40. up, I think. <laughs> well, <laughs> 32 well, on Monday. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 32. It's, it's, uh, it's, you know, when I turned 30, I was like, ah, you know what? I'm fine. I've still got, got, got plenty of time. And I just, I'm, I'm going to turn 32 shortly in a couple of days. And, you know, you start to wonder like, man, you know, I've only got a couple of years left to the, at this thing, you know, and I know that I always look after myself and train hard and hopefully I'll be riding until my late thirties, you know, but I think once you kind of get to that 32, 33, 34 age, you know, people start to, that if you have one or two bad rounds, they start to look at you like, man, maybe you use past it. You know? <laughs> so I'm very, I'm very, very grateful to, to have had this long of a career, but um, I, I still think I've got a couple of years left in me. You know, obviously Josh Hayes is one of the, you know, one of the, the you know, um, uh, it, 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 inspirations there you know as a guy that obviously was winning championships in his 30s and his 40s you know so hopefully i can kind of be a a, a you know josh hayes of the second if i could even do you know half of that i would be happy hey speaking of hayes when you came on and started riding the bike this year did yeah. did, did you have any of his notes or did any of that stuff cross over or you ride completely different and it was it was no use to you or do you have a starting spot at each track based on what he did no i mean we, we always look at, at josh's data you know just to kind of look at break points throttle points what he was kind of doing doing you know differently but um, the bike is quite a bit quicker this year than what than what he had last year, you know. So that definitely helps. We can see that, but um, I think we just have a, a very different riding style. Um, you know, so our setups are vastly, vastly 
different, you know, so we can't take some notes there, but overall, you know, as far as GPS speed, breakpoints, throttle points, everything else, we do sometimes look at his data, you know, and I think that that his gearing has definitely helped us as well. Okay. Had a lot of tracks. You know, Matthew, we, we had Ben Spees on it. Where was it? Was it, uh, oh, it was at Laguna. We had, we had on um, and we talked about something that I'm going to give you uh, a chance to comment on this too. And okay, it's a little controversial, but I'm going to bring this up. I'm going to bring up, I'm going to bring up three examples. We got to talk about it. Okay. Not this past March at Daytona, but the year before at De Daytona, J Josh Heron famously, well, Richie Escalante ended up off the track and it was a, it was a racing incident. You had yeah. a, a quasi similar thing happen um, where PJ ended up off the track, and then yeah. the third, and that was that was ended up they they uh, protested, and there was a penalty there, which uh, honestly was yep. a little bit of a moot point because it didn't affect you too much, but but still no. there was a there was a penalty, and then turnabout is fair play. Then it happened to you. You got pushed aside by PJ. Honestly, I cannot tell though between those three incidents, which are racing incidents and which is unsafe riding, whatever they want to call it. Um, and I'm putting you on the spot because you were the one that got nailed with it, but it was after a protest was made. Um, yeah. Did you guys as a team consider at all protesting mm -hmm. the when when PJ knocked you aside um, in that second time? We did. We did, you know, joke about it. Like, oh, you know, I'm going to protest him now. Right. But it, it never actually happened. You know, um, I think that a lot of those crashes, incidents, whatever you want to call it, um, I guess it's just whoever you, you speak to. You know, if you look at the ridge, I would say that I gave him space. He should have just kind of picked up the bike. He says that I came in hard to, I didn't, you know, give him enough space. And we touched, you know, Laguna Seca, I kind of say that, he did exactly the same move, but I saw him coming and I picked up the bike. And if I didn't, the same thing would have happened there. So you can look at it from my point of view, but if you speak to PJ or the Ray Hall guys, it's going to be completely different. And I think that that's just how racing is. You know, I think that a, a lot of people's perceptions change. What did they see? Um, but overall, it's just racing hard, having fun and... You know, obviously, I, I don't like to touch somebody on the track, but it, it does happen. But it's all, I think that all of these calls that we make are split-second decisions, you know. And sometimes you grab the brake thinking that you're going to make the corner fine and you get in a little bit hot and the front's moving. And you know that if you don't release a bit of pressure, you're going to crash. So you run out a little bit wider and sometimes somebody's there. You know, I think as long as it, it isn't malice that you're purposely making somebody crash, um, but yeah, I think that it's not the first time we've seen something like that and it won't be the last time either, you know, but uh, I do seem to find myself on in those incidents a little bit more than I should be. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know what the deal is. You think about there a couple of years ago with Danilo at, uh, at Ridge. I, I still don't understand that on that cool there. You were sitting there all of a sudden he comes up between you and was it Cam Peterson or who was it was next to you? When uh, I think it was actually Max Flinders. Oh, yeah, it was Max. Rode yeah. through and Albert, me and myself, and I looked at Max. I was like, did you just see that? What just <laughs> happened, man? <laughs> it was kind of a strange one. Um, but yeah, like I've said, I don't think Danilo's a, a, a bad guy. I just think that at that point of the season, a lot of things hadn't gone his way and just unfortunately kind of took his anger out in the wrong situation. But you know, um, I think I made a few harsh moves. He made a few harsh ones too. And just, <laughs> it's just, it's just how things go, I guess. Well, well, that's it. I mean, you, you have had some things happen and I'm not talking about this because this is something you have a reputation for. I'm actually talking about it because you do, oh, I do but it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but what is it? What is it? Is it because of your size on the bike? Because, you're I don't think you're more overly aggressive than anybody else obviously Josh Heron people know okay he's gonna he's gonna make some things happen when he's on the track watch him a little bit um yeah, they're just I some... kind of, of like that though you know it, okay. it kind of it kind of is good that when somebody knows that you behind them and they have that mindset of like he's coming through no yeah. matter what you know it kind of makes them freeze up a little bit you know so I don't mind if people think I'm like that but like I, we're saying, I don't think that anybody purposely does it, but it's just, you know, I've just, unfortunately, tr 
made some questionable moves, but but in my head at that time, I thought it was going to work out fine, you know. And I think that um, what did um, I think it was actually Senna that said that, that if you see a gap and you and you no longer go for it, you're no longer a racing car driver. Yeah. Oh wow! And sometimes I've sometimes I've <laughs> seen the gap and it actually hasn't been there, but you know, I, 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 I think more times. Uh, then not to have made it work out. Maybe when yeah, you're thir- maybe when you're 36, you'll <laughs> yeah, I'll start to second guess. A that's when you'll know. That's when you'll moves. know. <laughs> yes. No. Well, I mean, that's the scary, scary part is when you start to have those second thoughts. Is when you kind of have to look at yourself, like, hey, man, maybe I'm a little bit past this. But fortunately for me, I don't have those thoughts yet. I'm yeah. still in there pushing as hard as I can. <laughs> yeah yeah and Matthew I mean this is down the road for sure I mean you you're fit you're you know I think I think you can you can race past I think you can race into your 40s or even lo- longer let's let's do if you want to but my point is at some point do you have you thought about are you going to continue to stay somehow in racing and be involved in some way with a team or working with uh you know some aspect of of our our sport as you're older yeah, I mean, definitely. I think that how motorcycle racing is going lately, you're not going to make enough money that when you're done racing, you, you can just retire on these millions of dollars. So I'm going to have to find something to do afterwards. Um, but yeah, I mean, whether that's working as a rider coach, uh, running a team or whatever, you know, at this stage, I haven't thought to that far, but I'm right. definitely going to be part of the scene still. You know, I've been racing box my uh, Marks my whole life, and I don't see why it would it would change it now. You know, it's kind of you know, it's actually a funny you know story because at the start of the season when I lost the Westby ride, a lot of people asked me what my plan B was. You know, that, that if I didn't race, and I I always say that, that that there was no plan B. There never has been a plan B. You know, it's always been plan A, racing and making this work. You know, unfortunately, it it has so far. You know, but. One day in the future, I'll have to think of something else, I guess. Well, I mean, if, if things go according to your plan, I'm sure uh, you're going to have a, a super sport championship on your resume, too, which is, we could bode well for next year or after that or whatever might happen with your team or, or anything else down there. So, you know, like I've said before, racking up some wins isn't such a bad thing to have for your career. People are going to notice that. So and I mean, the bike's amazing. I love the colors on the bike and everything. It really you guys, your whole team really looks good out there. So. Um, we're looking forward to seeing it. You know, it's kind of sad. It's only two more or four more races, two more rounds on the season, but um, we're, we're glad you're going to continue to race with us anyway. That's for you know, sure. I, I've got a plan B for him. A plan B? <laughs> What's that, Paul? Race director. No, there's never going to be any penalties. Everything's going to be a racing incident. <laughs> It'll be perfect. Yeah, well, do what you want out there, guys. No red, no oh, red flags. No red flags. No, you know, no, unfortunately, I think I think of that that job. No matter how good you are, you know, everyone thinks thinks you're a complete wanker because <laughs> you're always, you know, upsetting somebody somewhere. Right. So it's definitely not a job for me. All right. All right. We won't do that one. We'll cross that off. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Right. I think we're, I think we're good. Um, They always go by quick when you, we have you on Matthew, but it's, it's good to have you on leading into these last two rounds. Good luck with all that. And uh, we'll, we'll see you next week. Thank you guys. See you. All right. Hey, hey, with the motocross stuff, just for the next couple of weeks, keep the wheels on the ground, maybe. (laughs) Uh, I've actually got the bike loaded. I'm I'm going first thing tomorrow morning. (laughs) <laughs> Saturday motos uh, all right. every single week, man. All right. He's, he's got to do it. Uh, safety first. All right. All right. I'll see you. All right. Bye, guys. Cheers, cheers. <laughs>